Transformation ground control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, and welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 48. This is the podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm normally here with Kyler Cheatham, but she is out sick today, so we'll be covering this here solo, uh, which is okay. Of, of all podcast episodes for me to cover solo, this might be a good one just because we're going to do the fourth in our series of Best of 2021. Where we're going to talk more specifically today about digital strategy. Now, if you missed episodes 45 through 47, which are the last three episodes we released prior to today, or prior to this uh, week's episode, we covered the people, process, and technology components within each of those best of series. So in episode 45, we covered uh, the people or the change management side of, of digital str- strategy and digital transformation. So that episode was sort of the best of the podcast related to organizational change management for, for the year. Uh, episode number 47, or I'm sorry, episode number 46 covers process, business process management, business process mining, process improvement, all that good stuff. That's in episode number 46. And then last week's episode, number 47, we covered the technology best of 2021. So everything related to technology, architecture, application selection, infrastructure, that sort of thing. So be sure to check out those episodes if you haven't already, uh, particularly if you're interested in the people, process, and or technology side of things. That best of series uh, is a a good one. It covers some of the highlights from the year in each of those, those areas. And you could argue that today's episode is arguably the most important one because we're talking about digital strategy and none of that other stuff matters. People process technology doesn't really matter if you've got the wrong digital strategy. And this is a a challenge a lot of organizations have. A lot of companies we work with that hire us to help them define their digital strategies really struggle to find and define agnostically a digital transformation roadmap and strategy that's specific to them meets their strategic goals and objectives, addresses their priorities, their key needs, takes into consideration their culture, the current environment that they're in, all that stuff is really important to defining a digital strategy that is appropriate for any organization. And one of the challenges with defining digital strategies is that software vendors and system integrators typically will push you or nudge you in a certain direction as you're trying to define your strategy. So for example, if I'm a SAP or a Microsoft provider, whatever software it is I'm selling, I'm probably going to nudge you in the direction of expanding the footprint or deploying the footprint of my technology as broadly as possible within your organization. And that's human nature. That's what people do when they're trying to sell a product. But we as organizations, when we're defining our digital strategy, need to be more agnostic than that, more independent, more objective. And we need to be more aligned with what our overall goals and objectives are. So it's not enough to say that we want to take a technology first approach. We need to first define what is it we're trying to accomplish as an organization, what do we want to be when we grow up, and all that good stuff. So that's really the premise of today's conversation and and where we wanted to to dig in. And today's conversation, we're going to cover a few different things. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the uh, digital strategy trends in the market, a few newsworthy items that we've uncovered over the last few weeks as it relates to digital strategy. And we're also going to feature a few clips from interviews throughout 2021, some of the best of series here related to digital to digital strategy. And the first, uh, after we do the hot topics, the first guest or the first clip we'll play from earlier in this podcast season is from episode 40. And we're going to do a digital strategy client case study with Braden Gerbig from Third Stage Consulting. He's going to talk about the case study for a chemical manufacturer in Latin America that is trying to standardize their operations and needed help defining their digital strategy and roadmap. So we're going to talk to him and and play a clip from that uh, extensive interview. We'll play sort of the highlights of that clip uh, shortly after we we cover the hot topics here. And then after Braden's on the show later, we're going to talk about human capital management and the human capital digital strategy 
at an oil and gas client of third stages. So this is a, a company in uh, Asia Pacific, and they were looking to define a digital strategy and roadmap, particularly for their HR technology, their human capital management technologies. And so it, just another case study, but more focused on the HR and HCM side of things. And then finally, our last clip in today's episode will feature Khalid Morris, who is a uh, director at Third Stage Consulting, uh, similar to, to Braden, who's the first guest we'll have on today. And Khalid's going to be on the show talking about sports and the science of winning and how a sports analogy or the way sports teams are coached, the way they execute, the way they game plan, the way they prepare, how all that mentality of, of athletes in competitive sports teams that are focused on winning, what are some of the lessons we can take from sports when applying those concepts to our digital transformation and our overall digital strategy. So we're going to play you a clip from that. So really good variety of, of guests here today. Uh, should be a, a good uh, discussion here today. But before we bring on our guests, there's a few things I wanted to cover from the perspective of recent news or hot topics in the world of digital strategy. And the first one is actually building on something we talked about last week. In our last episode, we talked about how AWS or Amazon Web Services had recently had an outage, uh, a pretty widespread outage in the United States that triggered a bunch of consumer facing uh, streaming providers and other household names, uh, technology providers caused them to go down. So for example, um, at that time, Netflix was one of the organizations that was affected by the outage. And so we unpacked that a bit in last week's episode. And since we recorded last week's episode, uh, there's been another outage with AWS um, and now there's a better understanding of why some of these outages are happening. And in this most recent outage that happened, it was actually on December 15th of 2021, when this most recent one happened at the time we we're recording this podcast, there was another AWS outage that, that caused a number of websites to be down, a, a number of popular applications to be down as well. So for example, Hulu, uh, DoorDash, PlayStation, QuickBooks, were just a few examples of organizations that experienced outages. And these are just the big name household names. I'm sure there's a host of other providers and other mom and pop uh, organizations that rely on AWS for their hosting and cloud infrastructure needs. But this whole thing is a interesting reminder at best that relying on a large cloud provider has its risks. And I think we're seeing more and more of these, these sort of outages. And while some of these outages are not super uh, long term, for example, the most recent one on December 15th with AWS was about an hour and a half, um, that, that still is considerable. If you're trying to run your operations and you're trying to ship product and conduct financial transactions and take customer orders, whatever the case may be, suddenly your cloud provider goes down, you can't access your systems. What does that do to your operations? And so that's one of the things that you know, you really need to think about when defining your, your cloud strategy, your overall infrastructure solutions. And what we found in this case, or what we found in our research related to this most recent um, outage, was that there was some sort of mistake. It was either a technology and or a human mistake in the system that handled network loads. And that was largely what was creating the problems. Now, Amazon hasn't been very specific about what exactly those um, situations or the, or the challenges were, but what it, it's clear is that there's a problem that AWS seems to be having with the volume and the scale that it's built over the years. And I, I guess this may be the early signs that some of these big cloud hosting providers, even they, as massive as they are, are going to have their weaknesses and their limitations on what they can handle. And it's also a good reminder that you don't have to necessarily rely on a big organization like it. AWS for your cloud hosting needs. And we talked about this in last week's episode too. If you're looking at AWS, uh, Azure, for example, those are two very popular, very common cloud hosting providers, but there are a ton of second tier and even third tier uh, cloud hosting providers that maybe are have more capacity to handle uh, organizations like yourselves. Uh, they may have more attention they're able to provide to you uh, as, an, as an organization in terms of customer service. So that's some things to think about is really understanding, you know, how much do you want to concentrate your risk with one of these big technology or cloud providers? And first of all, are there 
the first question to ask yourself are, are there other alternate providers that you could be considering? Um, that's something that a lot of organizations don't think a lot about. They assume that AWS is a big name, it's Amazon, everyone knows it. Um, we're all comfortable with that name, so that seems like a safe bet, but what we're seeing here is that there are challenges with, with some of these large hosting providers and loud, large cloud providers. And so the question then becomes, are there better options out there? Are there other providers that can provide um, service along those lines? Just as an example, in last week's episode, one of our best of on the technology side, we actually covered cloud infrastructure managed services, and the person I interviewed in that discussion was a gentleman named Brad Feeks, who's from a company called Estes Group. And Estes Group is just an example of many, uh, I don't know how many there are, dozens or hundreds, I would imagine, maybe even thousands throughout the world, of mid-size, mid-market sorts of uh, cloud and hosting managed services providers. So, you know, I think it, doing your due diligence to understand what your options are, you know, what the risks are, what the cost, long-term costs and risks are going to be, long-term business value, all that stuff is, is really important, and that's something that a lot of times organizations overlook when defining their, their cloud strategy. So AWS had the outage. Uh, it's over now, at least at the time of recording this, this podcast. We'll just have to keep an eye on that to see if that continues to be a problem for AWS providers in the future. Now, another uh, hot topic within the realm of digital strategy is, and it's also actually related to cybersecurity and outages, but this one that we found is related to uh, Kronos, which is an HCM and payroll system. And Kronos experienced a hack. So the company is called Ultimate Kronos Group. Um, and they, they uh, I believe it's a merger between two companies, if I remember correctly, it's uh, uh, UPG and, and uh, Kronos, or Ultimate Software and Kronos, and they uh, merged to, to create uh, Ultimate Kronos Group. And they suffered a ransomware attack that may keep its systems offline for weeks. And to ensure that employees are paid, customers, are customers that rely on the software are working to find backup plans, including ways to issue paper checks, um, some for the first time in years. So there, a lot of companies are having to scramble to figure out how they're going to address this fact that their HR and payroll system went down. And again, this is another vulnerability of the cloud. Now all of a sudden, organizations that are using Kronos software and were affected by this hack, they suddenly are at the mercy of the, the provider and the fact that there's a vulnerability and the fact that now they can't run their business because they've outsourced their, their HR operations and technology needs to a third party provider. Now, just, as a, just to give you some context of the types of organizations that were affected by this, um, there was a lot of large US-based businesses, I believe, I don't know if this was a worldwide outage or if it only affected U.S.-based companies, but the big names that, that we found in our research were uh, U.S.-based companies that were affected by, by the outage. So organizations such as uh, you know, hospital workers in Texas, uh, public workers in Honolulu, New York's Metro Transportation Authority, um, University of Utah, George Washington University, um, I believe Cleveland Clinic, or the city of Cleveland well, was another another example. So a lot of fairly big government and, and public types of organizations that are now trying to figure out and trying to scramble to pay their employees. And uh, that's a pretty big deal to have an outage like that and all of a sudden have to revert back to your paper processes because you have no choice. It's the only way to keep your, your uh, operations up and running. So it's not super clear uh, as far as when this hack or when this ransomware situation will be resolved, but Again, the, the timeline that's been outlined in the, the research we have is that there, there's weeks involved here, weeks before they can recover and, and get the systems back up and operating. Now, to be clear, not every Kronos customer was affected by this outage. Um, I believe it was just organizations that were using their private cloud edition of the software. And I, even there, I don't know, it's not clear to me if it was all the customers using private cloud or just a subset of them. but. Given the names that were affected, I have to think that there was a lot more organizations that were uh, affected by that by that outage than than uh, we might see on the surface there. So that's the deal with with Chrono. So it, again, another reminder that really having uh, backup plans in place and understanding the risk that when you outsource your technology and your business processes and your operations to a third party technology provider, there is an absolute risk there that a lot of times organizations don't think about or they take for granted 
uh, that the cloud providers are going to uh, provide everything they need. Now, the last thing I'll cover here in terms of hot topics for this week as it relates to digital strategy is in the healthcare space. And this is really interesting because I think a lot of us can relate to this, especially if you've tried to go to the doctor or had any sort of healthcare uh, interaction since the pandemic started in 2020. You saw a lot of organizations that were moving towards a, a virtual healthcare and telehealth uh, sort of model. So you know, given the pandemic and given the fact that you had a lot of sick people going to doctors, they moved to more of a telehealth model um, out of necessity, really. But what we're seeing is that move out of necessity is now triggering a longer term focus on digital transformations within the healthcare space. So telehealth is becoming more and more common. Uh, that sort of virtual healthcare model is becoming more common and it seems to be more permanent than just a temporary pandemic reaction. And so the whole telehealth model seems to be, be here for, for a while. Um, but then you're also seeing some merger and acquisition activity in the space that suggests that there's other, uh, there's, there's a lot of money chasing this virtual e-health sort of uh, model. And for example, there's a company called Ginger, which is a virtual mental health platform. They merged with another uh, provider called Headspace to, provor, to provide a merged entity called Headspace Health. And the big advantage that they see in combining forces is that they can use data, big data and analytics to better support providers. So that's another example of where organizations that are focused on virtual healthcare are consolidating, they're looking for scale, there's money chasing these models which suggests that there's a lot of optimism around this whole um, digital transformation space within healthcare in particular. And in addition to that, you had United Healthcare, which is a large uh, healthcare provider that announced the launch of its virtual first health plan, which is called Navigate Now. And this will include round the clock access to a care team for primary, urgent, and behavioral healthcare services. And you're seeing more organizations too within healthcare moving from a fee for service model to a value based care approach. And this is really interesting finding for me and just kind of seeing what's happening in the healthcare space because we've, we've been involved with healthcare for years now as an organization and as a team, and a lot of our clients are in the space. And historically, digital transformation would focus on EHR or electronic health records. So really trying to automate and tie together data related to patients and patient care so that you have one source of truth for any types of service that you provide or any type of care you provide to a, a uh, customer or a patient. And that's still very relevant. So you have, you, we're seeing systems or, or software vendors like uh, Epic, for example, is a common EHR platform within the healthcare space. You also have Infor uh, Cloud Suite, which is a, it's a larger, or more broader ERP system that operates in a number of different verticals, but they have a strong presence in healthcare. And those are just two examples, Infor and, and uh, Epic. And that model is still evolving. I mean, companies are still investing in EHR and, and trying to automate some of the patient care and healthcare records uh, aspects of their operations. But what you're seeing now is organizations are within the healthcare space are going one step further. Not only are they trying to automate their EHR, their financials, inventory management, supply chain, all that sort of stuff. Now they're sort, they're sort of evolving and moving even further into just changing their entire business models and providing more of a, health, a virtual uh, health care model. So it's a really interesting, uh, I guess, reminder, even if you're not in healthcare, that there are a lot of ways that technology can be used to totally transform or rethink your business model. It's not necessarily just an incremental improvement to automating your current processes and sort of taking baby steps towards new business models. There are organizations out there and even some industries that are seeing a lot bigger quantum leaps towards complete business model evolutions, business model changes. Another real basic and common example that many of you are probably familiar with is within the retail space. You know, bricks and mortar retailers have sort of been forced due to the pandemic. And by the way, that the trend was actually starting well before the pandemic, but the pandemic really put it into overdrive, that whole trend towards e-commerce and uh, digital digitization of the customer experience. And so bricks and mortar companies that were dependent uh, on just physical traffic, physical sales within their bricks and mortar stores, they suddenly faced a crisis during 
the pandemic, especially the early stages when there were lockdowns and shutdowns throughout the world. But what we're seeing is even now, even after the pandemic is starting to ease and countries in different parts of the world are starting to reopen or continuing to reopen and continuing to ease social distancing and whatnot and put less restriction on trade, even in those cases, you're still seeing retailers make more of a permanent tectonic shift towards this e-commerce model, providing a better customer experience in a digital way. And so, again, a good reminder that regardless of what industry you're in, it's, chances are pretty high that either technology and or external macro customer forces are going to force you to move in that direction, whether you like it or not. Uh, one last thing I'll, I'll mention is a, a lot of uh, a lot of what we talked about earlier was related to Amazon. When we were talking about AWS in the opening segment or the beginning of the segment, and speaking of Amazon, Amazon is a retailer that a lot of people at the consumer individual level are comfortable with and used to. And what we're seeing is that people that work at home or uh, shop from home, they'll shop Amazon for their personal lives. They are expecting a similar type of experience in their in their business or professional lives. So even if you're a B2B uh, seller of products or services, chances are you're going to be affected by the fact that Amazon is disrupting the business to consumer retail space, even though if you're B2B, you're still going to be affected by the fact that Amazon is having that sort of disruption because people's expectations have changed, people's comfort levels with old data technologies has has changed, and people just expect the opportunity to be able to interact and provide more of a digital touch point with your organization. So. When defining your digital strategy, which is the whole theme of today's episode, it's really important to think about you know, ways we can change our business models, ways we can increase or improve the customer experience, and ways that we can really leverage technology and digitization to make our business models stronger and better. So those are just a few hot topics related to this whole concept of digital strategy that, that hopefully sets the context for today. And I want to segue um, to our first clip, which actually... I didn't mention this, I failed to mention this at the, the beginning of the, uh, the episode in the intro, but before I get to all the guests here today, uh, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, I'm going to play you a clip uh, of a YouTube video I did early this year in 2021 that is just an intro to digital strategies, about a nine minute clip, and it uh, provides an overview of sort of the, the major threads or major things to think about when defining your digital strategy and roadmap. And I wanted to play this clip as a way to set the context or set the stage for the other interviews, the other conversations we're going to have uh, throughout today's episode. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be back with uh, that clip. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 48. This is the best of digital strategy interviews and topics from our podcast in 2021, part of our best of 2021 series for the year end here. And what I want to do today, and, and actually before I get into the, to this next clip, uh, just a reminder, we have new episodes every Wednesday. You can find new episodes on YouTube and LinkedIn. You can also subscribe and listen to any of the audio podcast platforms. So Amazon, Google, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, etc. Wherever you listen to podcasts, check us out. Transformation Ground Control is the name. Be sure to subscribe, give us a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Now, before we get into all of our sort of best of interviews from the podcast related to digital strategy throughout the year, I wanted to play you a clip that's just sort of an intro, basic intro to what digital strategy is, what are the major components, what should you be thinking about, and I think this will set the context for some of the other conversations where we get into some deeper dive case studies and specific examples related to some of these concepts. So this is a video I made because I, I had realized uh, several months ago or you know mid-2021, halfway through the year, 
that I had a lot of digital strategy content on my YouTube channel, but I didn't have anything that really sort of provided a basic intro to or a, a digital strategy 101 sort of sort of uh, clip. So this is about a nine minute clip that we'll play for you that, that talks through, I think, five or six major threads that you should be thinking about as it relates to digital strategy. So with that being said, let's roll the clip right here. And when we think about digital transformations and digital strategies, we often think about that roadmap, that three to five year roadmap of where we're going and how we're gonna get there, what the business case is, what the changes will be, how much it'll cost, all that good stuff. But the stuff before that of how to get there oftentimes can be confusing. And there's a lot of conflicting information in the marketplace. So really getting an agnostic objective view of what our digital strategy should be is very important. So what I wanna talk about today are the things that are most critical from a technology agnostic perspective to define the framework and the digital strategy that best fits you and fits your priorities as an organization. The first step in defining a digital strategy is to forget the word digital temporarily. Forget about that and talk about your strategy. What is your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish as an organization? Make sure you're aligned as an organization, especially as an executive team, as to what that strategy is. And then you can start to translate that strategy into what it means for your digital transformation. So for example, if you know you wanna change your business model or your operating model or provide a better customer experience in certain specific ways, you can then start to translate what types of technological and process and organizational changes can help us in that transformational journey. So the first step then is to make sure we have alignment in our overarching strategy and then make sure that we translate that overarching corporate strategy into a digital strategy in terms of just high level parameters to start. What are the things that we know we want the digital strategy to accomplish, whether it be reducing cost or providing better customer experience or providing more flexibility and agility within the organization, whatever it may be, make sure that you translate that overarching corporate strategy into something that can be tangible for your digital strategy. The next step in defining a digital strategy is to address your business processes and your operating model. And there's two dimensions of this. First of all is understanding your current state. What is it we're doing today? Where are the pain points? And what are the things we know we want to improve and the things we know we want to change? And within that, by the way, you're probably gonna to wanna to prioritize the things that are most important and the things that are most aligned with that corporate strategy that we talked about in the last segment. Now, the second dimension of business processes and operating model is really shifting gears and focusing on the future state. So we've assessed the current state, we look at where the pain points are and the things we think we want to improve, then we define what is it we want the future state to look like. What are those improvements? What are those enhancements? And ultimately, we'll get to how can technology support us in that journey. But for now, we're just focused on operations and business processes. So that's the next step or an important work stream within defining your digital strategies to take that operational business process view of where you're headed as an organization. Now, the next step in defining a digital strategy is to define what your enterprise applications are and what sort of system architecture or solution architecture is going to best support that digital strategy. So notice that we haven't really talked about technology yet. We talked about strategy. We talked about business processes and operating model. Once you've done that assessment, you've defined your strategy and your future state operating model. Now you can start to look at technologies that might help you get there. And at this point, you may or may not be ready to define specific vendors yet, but it may just be certain types of technology. So you may just be looking at a high level at potential CRM options or supply chain automation or ERP systems, financial systems, whatever the case may be, there's certain types of technologies that you might be looking at and understanding how could those technologies potentially help enable the process and strategic improvements that you've defined up until this point. So that's part of it is starting to look at specific technologies and types of technologies that will help you in your transformation. The second part of it is also looking at how those systems will tie together, assuming you're gonna have more than one type of technology to drive your transformation in the future. You wanna make sure you understand how those technologies all tie together, how they'll integrate, where the single source of data will be, how you'll roll out those different technologies and phase them into the organization. All that stuff is part of solution architecture and planning that you wanna make sure you bake into your overall enterprise application and solution architecture strategy. Now, as this digital strategy starts to come into focus, as we've looked at strategy processes and now even technologies, now what starts to come into focus is the organizational impact. 
if we go this route that we've defined so far, what is that impact going to mean to the organization? How big of a change is it going to be? How big of a risk is it going to be organizationally? Where are the pockets of resistance going to be? Who's going to be impacted the most by this transformation? Those are the types of things we need to be defining as part of our organizational change strategy. And an effective way to do this is to assess the overall organization as it is now and start to proactively identify where those pockets of resistance might be and where the biggest challenges might be. And it's also an opportunity to assess your culture, understand your culture today and how you wanna bend that culture or how you will need to bend that culture to support this digital strategy going forward. So all that stuff is part of the organizational change strategy. And I know I've talked at a very high level about change management here, but there's plenty of other videos on my YouTube channel that talk about organizational change management, best practices and tactics. So I encourage you to check out some of those videos as well. So the next portion of a digital strategy is your data and analytics. Where is your data going to reside? How are you going to cleanse the data? What's the single source of truth? And how is it going to fit into your overall architecture and your overall digital strategy? Now, another important part of data and analytics is the whole master data management process. So what are you going to do to transform your business in terms of how you manage data? Chances are that you probably need better governance around your data. You want to have repeatable, sustainable processes that help make sure your data is maintained well. So having those master data management processes in place is critical. And then finally, another component of data and analytics is really understanding the business intelligence, the reporting, any sort of predictive analytics and quantitative tools that your technology can provide, what does that tool set look like and how can technology help you get there? So really looking at not just the core technologies of what can automate your processes, but looking at the layer above that that takes all that information, that transactional data, and spits out something of use to you in terms of information, whether it be predictive analytics or certain types of reporting or BI tools, whatever the case may be, you wanna make sure you look at that component as well. Now, once we've defined all these different moving parts and pieces of our digital strategy, we have to define what is our implementation strategy, our overall transformation strategy and plan. We're not going to boil the ocean overnight. We're not going to make these changes overnight. So we need to look further down the line of how long is this going to take and what is our phasing strategy? How are we going to incrementally roll these changes out to the organization? What are our priorities? What's our overall strategy? Now, one thing I'll note is that for larger organizations, this could be a multi-year journey. It could be three, five, seven years that you're going down this path. So you really are looking out well into the future. And even if you're a small or mid-sized organization, chances are it's probably going to be a 12 to 24 plus month journey. And so regardless of how long it is, you want to make sure you're looking at the entire duration, the phasing strategy, and the overall approach and resource plan to help you get there. Now, finally, but certainly not least importantly, is the business case and ROI analysis. Looking at the numbers, how much is this going to cost you? And realistically, what sort of business benefits do we expect to see? And what sort of measurable business benefits do we expect to see? You certainly are going to have intangible business benefits. You might certainly have burning platform types of reasons for change, such as you need to replace your old technology. But those intangibles, unquantifiable benefits are not enough. You need to have quantifiable, measurable business benefits not only to help justify the project and the overall digital strategy, but to give you some project governance framework to help you make decisions throughout the transformation. So it'll help you decide, for example, if it makes sense to customize a technology. Without the benefit of having a business case, you won't know how to make that decision. You won't have the data, you won't have the ROI analysis to help point to. So making sure that you use that as a governance tool during implementation and then also post implementation as a benefits realization tool to make sure that you actually realize those benefits and optimize the benefits. And by the way, spoiler alert, you're probably not going to realize all those benefits on day one. It's going to take you some time. So that business case and ROI analysis becomes handy again after implementation during the multiple phases of your transformation. So make sure you have a business case and ROI analysis for justification, for project governance during the transformation, and also to optimize business benefits after the transformation. All right, well, hopefully that gives you a good overview of the intro to digital strategy and gives you some things to think about as it relates to the five major threads that relate to digital transformation. And that's really meant to set the context for the other interviews we're gonna to get to here today. So when we come back, we're gonna, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, um, we're going to jump into our, our first guest, actually, which is going to be uh, Braden Gerbig, 
Uh, he provides us a case study of a Latin American-based chemical manufacturer, mid-size, high-growth chemical manufacturer that we are working with at the moment. And he's going to talk about some of the lessons learned from helping them define their digital strategy. So we're going to take some of these concepts that we just played in the clip we just played for you, and we're going to uh, unpack that for you here in a moment. But before we do that, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 48. My name is Eric Kimberling. Uh, Kyler Cheatham, who's normally with me, is out ill today, so hopefully she recovers soon and will be with us on our next episode next week. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm flying solo here today, trying to walk us through some of these topics here today. And what I want to do next is we just talked about, or we just had a clip, uh, which is which is one of my favorite clips from my YouTube channel uh, through the year. It's one of my uh, favorite videos that I made this year. Uh, and if you don't already subscribe to my YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe. Um, I put out new videos three to four times a week. Um, I have sort of my two, two a week that are sort of my flagship videos that come out on Mondays and Thursdays. And I also typically do one live stream a week and then uh, once a week this podcast uh, streamed live on, on YouTube as well. So be sure to subscribe to that way you get alerts whenever, um, whenever a new one comes out. But that was one of my favorite videos to make just because I love digital strategy. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I felt like it was a, just a good overview or sort of a, a basic intro to digital strategy. And the reason I wanted to play that again is because it, it sets the context for some of the conversation or some of the clips we're going to play here uh, in the next few minutes. And just to summarize a couple things, one is that, um, you know, there were major components of that digital strategy uh, framework that I talked about in that video. Um, you had your strategic alignment, which is really focused on making sure that your, your corporate and organizational strategy is aligned with your overall digital transformation strategy and, and vice versa. So strategic alignment is critical and that's where a lot of organization, I'd, organizations I'd say are most likely to fail or to slip up is that they just start marching down the path of a digital strategy, but that digital strategy approach and the roadmap is not aligned with their goals and objectives as an organization and or who they are as an organization right now. A lot of times we'll see digital strategies that are inconsistent with the cultures of the organization, inconsistent with who they're trying to be when they grow up. Um, and oftentimes you're sort of fighting gravity. You've got the inertia of where you are today, where you define a digital strategy that doesn't really get you to the next level. It just simply automates or adds new technology and adds cost in many cases to your existing environment. And it just makes it look better, but you're still inefficient. You still have broken processes. You still have manual processes. You're leaving a lot of business value on the table. Now you've just introduced new technology that costs you a lot of money, but you're not getting the business value out of it. So those are some of the common breakdowns we see at more of that executive alignment or strategic alignment uh, side of things. And then same with the operating model, defining your future state operational model. You want to make sure it's defined in a way that looks at, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish? What do you want your business to look like first? And then figure out the technology that's going to best help you get there. So that operational model, is very important as is the organizational change model as well, or the organizational change strategy. So what are your uh, change strategies? What are your change tactics that you're going to use to enable uh, the, the new direction you're going? And then you also have the, the more technical thread within your digital strategy and roadmap, which is the architecture, the data, analytics, business intelligence, really the thread that really ties it all together, that ties together the different technologies, ties together your operations and your people and your strategy, into the technical landscape. 
And then finally, you know, the last thing I talked about in that clip was the business value and ROI. How are you going to measure the business value? How are you going to measure business benefits? How are you going to set targets so you know where you're falling short? And by the way, spoiler alert, when you do execute your digital strategy, chances are very high you're not going to achieve all of your benefits on day one. It's going to take you time. It's going to take iterations. It's going to take con constant improvement and reassessing and pivoting of where you are. But the key is to measure it. If you don't measure it, you're just never going to achieve the value you're looking for. And uh, it's, it's kind of like the old adage that you, you only measure or you only achieve what you can measure. And if you're not measuring business value as part of your digital strategy, you're not going to achieve business value. You might luck out and get, I guess, a little bit of business value here and there, but you're going to leave a lot of money and a lot of opportunity on the table uh, if you don't uh, clearly define that benefits realization and business value strategy. So those are just sort of the, the recap of some of the major themes in that video. And I want to use that to segue into our first clip uh, from uh, episode number 40, which we had about an hour long conversation with Braden Gerbig, who's a director here at Third Stage Consulting. And he's talking about one of our clients in Latin America. It's a chemical manufacturer that is trying to standardize their operations, their manufacturing, their distribution across, I think, seven or nine different countries that they operate in. And uh, he's going to unpack some of those uh, challenges and lessons learned. And we're going to play you just about 12 or 13 minutes of that clip, um, it, but it's a full hour interview. So if you like what you hear here, be sure to go back to episode number 40 of this podcast to hear the full episode. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and roll the clip with Braden Gerbig from Third Stage Consulting. Total global audience here today. So this is a very fitting topic, I think, for, for a global audience, given that we're going to cover some global uh, organizations here today. Um, but let's start off with, um, you know, of these three case studies, let's start off with the, uh, um, why don't we start with the, the, uh, the, uh, not the industrial component one, the uh, chemical manufacturer in Latin America. Let's start there and uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about the company without mentioning it by name, obviously, or revealing confidential info. Just tell us a little bit about the size, scope, complexity of that organization. And uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. Without uh, uh, giving away too much, it's a, a large uh, chemical manufacturer and um, uh, they deal with, um, you know, a lot of uh, distribution challenges uh, in a number of different uh, Latin American uh, countries. Um, so, you know, you're talking more than a handful of uh, different countries. So localization is a big concern. Um, and when you take a, a large uh, ERP uh, spread across um, in you know numerous uh, uh, countries and, and locations. Um, you know the challenges become several in terms of not only the the usage at the the user level, uh, but then also uh, standardization at the the corporate and, and leadership level. So uh, trying to um, establish the leadership uh, as that across a number of different co countries. I keep wanting to say companies, but countries. Um, it's really the challenge. So going to each of the, each of those locations and, and uh, identifying the challenges, uh, bringing that back and uh, standardizing uh, how we'll approach that from a systems perspective is extremely important. Uh, so you mentioned that they're uh, Latin American uh, uh, companies. So, uh, you know, we also have uh, language uh, and cultural uh, differences that uh, we navigate through uh, during during the uh, course of the system concerns. Um, and so with that, we have uh, translation during sessions and and it's it's a bit of a um, uh, unique challenge when you're working, especially uh, remote uh, over over a laptop or over a computer uh, conducting sessions uh, with translation. Um, you have a lot of real time chats that are uh, going from uh, Spanish to English or English to Spanish uh, and then also discussion. Uh, and decisions being made in those meetings. Uh, so it's a lot to keep track of. Uh, excited to, to take on challenges and uh, it's really you know, it's quite an experience from a learning perspective, uh, just in terms of how we, how we manage across uh, language and culture uh, remotely. Um, so we're applying those, those lessons learned to, uh, to our exploration process and it's, it's, it's going well so far. Good, good. So what, what is it that Maybe just to look at the the big picture of of what led this company to um, to their digital transformation. Why are they going through this? Why did they hire us? And maybe what what was the problem statement they were trying to solve? Sure. So you know they're they're a legacy user of uh, uh, 
Yeah. Well, I, I should say uh, legacy user of SAP. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, this this is not unique to US, SAP. It's it's a challenge that we have with a, a number of uh, companies that have uh, legacy ERP that are uh, not only uh, in place for a number of years, but um, uh, various modules, various customizations. Um, taking that legacy ERP to uh, current current uh, uh, abilities and inversion, uh, uh, looking at uh, is is that ERP still the best fit? Uh, do we want to consider other uh, elements or continue with uh, that ERP or another vendor uh, and start uh, assessing uh, the needs really at the at the user level? Uh, to understand if we want to go through a full selection or or uh, just an upgrade, um, so those are the kinds of things that we're we're approaching. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, with with the number of countries involved, uh, you know we have SI considerations as well. Um, you know the localization is is really a big concern when we when it comes down to the SI. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that you know, the cultural and language aspects that you were talking about a moment ago, and then not obviously the, you know, the complexity of the organization in general is obviously a, a big consideration uh, as, as we're thinking through this. All right, good stuff, Braden. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to pick up the conversation where we left off. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm in the middle of playing you a clip from episode number 40 with Braden Gerbig from Third Stage Consulting. He's talking about the digital strategy for one of our clients in Latin America. Let's roll the clip. So they're 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 on a legacy SAP system. They're trying to figure out do they do we upgrade? Do we just upgrade to the S4 HANA within SAP, or do we look at something uh, totally different? Um, what how how are we helping them? I mean, what is what is the process we've gone through so far? Uh, in the journey that's sort of midstream right now. Fine. Yeah, we, we go through our selling documentation, but uh, conducting a number of interviews, both at the leadership level and then also uh, what I call the uh, the frontline managers of those processes, uh, really getting some in-depth detail around uh, how the organization works uh, and then applying that to the system landscape, whether that's um, tier one vendors or tier two vendors. Um, we cast a pretty broad net at first uh, and then narrow that down to a short list uh, pretty quickly uh, to understand uh, who will be involved in the RFP process. Uh, and then we reach out to those vendors to conduct uh, the RFP process. And from there, it really comes down to uh, uh, demonstrations following RFPs. Uh, we're not quite there yet, um, but the demonstrations really help us understand not only how, how the system uh, accomplishes the requirements, as we understand them in the current state, uh, but we also want to uh, observe that uh, and really understand um, how it works in their system. And that's a very scripted uh, process and that's uh, designed to uh, standardize the response so that we can uh, compare uh, uh, standard across uh, uh, vendors because the systems are not all going to look and feel the same and we want to we want to really drive out the the functionality and understand how the system will work in, the, in their environment right right so what um what are some of the the lessons you've seen so far on this evaluation i know it's early you know we're still working towards that decision and path forward but what, what are some of the lessons you're finding or some of the 
takeaways or aha moments that we've had so far on this project? Yeah, I'd say for for this um, this client in particular, the challenge is not so much will the system work uh, for us. It's it, the challenge is really more around, uh, uh, I guess, disqualifying a vendor than it is um, uh, identifying uh, the, the most appropriate. So, by that I mean, uh, you know, all all systems will all the systems we're evaluating. Uh, will work for the challenges we're, we're um, exploring at the moment. Um, so it really comes down to um, really getting into the, the lower level detail to identify the correct vendor. Um, uh, so by that, I mean, if, if, if all vendors um, that we're assessing at the moment uh, have the functionality or the capability to work with uh, the client in terms of their needs, uh, it really comes down to uh, how they partner with the client, uh, the total cost of ownership, uh, long-term concerns, uh, really you know, digging into the detail of the business case. So uh, that's that's the probably the first lesson. The second lesson is when you look at tier one um, uh, vendors, uh, whether it's uh, you know the the usual names that come to mind, SAP, Oracle, or other. Um, you know, you're really assessing uh, uh, not only the, the partnership levels, but also the peer group in the industry and do they work well in that industry? Um, you know, there are some cases where uh, certain industries are a challenge for some vendors. Right, right. So I know it's early to ask this and uh, it's always risky as a consultant to jump to conclusions, but uh, given given what you know so far and what we know so far about this client, what do you, what do you think they'll do? I mean, if you had to bet money, on, are they going to stay on SAP or are they going to go with something different? What do you where where, where did you bet your money? I hate betting, by the way, but if I like yeah. to ask them, where they bet their money, <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty dangerous question to ask in the middle of a selection, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll go ahead and answer it anyways. Um, you know, there, there's there's some things that. Um, are beneficial to understanding the legacy environment. Uh, you know the vendor, you know the challenges associated with the vendor, um, you understand where you might need some additional support in terms of other applications, bolt-ons or integrations, things of that nature. Um, you also understand uh, the industry challenges with the vendor. So uh, I, th I guess to, to quit dodging the question, my, my gut feeling my gut feeling is is that they'll uh, continue um, with SAP. Now, whether or not that's um, how that continuation occurs, that still remains. Yeah, yeah, and I know I know that's an unfair question to put you on the spot like that, but it, it is an interesting <laughs> dynamic though because we see that a lot, right? Where, where clients, I mean, some clients we work with on their evaluations, they have old legacy, you know, homegrown systems that clearly need to go, and they're clearly going to rip it out and do something different. But then you get clients like this where they're using a semi-modern ERP system. They've invested a lot of time and money in it. They've built competencies around it. And so the threshold, it seems like the threshold that you, you have to meet to be able to justify ripping that out and going a totally different direction mm -hmm. at the much higher threshold, even if the system's imperfect, you know, even if there's theoretically a system out there that might be slightly better than what they have, it's, it's, it's got to be a lot more than that to be able to justify the risk and the cost of just kind of throwing that all out and starting over with a new new system or landscape. Yeah, that's that, that's absolutely correct. And you know, a lot of times uh, our clients, and this is true of, I think most of our clients are going through some kind of life cycle event, and and that triggers the the need for um, adjustment. You know, whether that's uh, throwing out a perfectly good system, and I don't want to say throwing out because we do carry forward a lot of the process, a lot of the understanding that the system provides. Uh, but if, if we're replacing that with a new system, uh, the business case has to be pretty sound. And then I think that's what I mean by uh, when I say disqualifying other vendors, you know, you have to have a really good reason uh, for why one vendor works and why, why another vendor doesn't. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Braden. Appreciate having you on the show. And again, that full interview can be found in episode number 40. So if you go back to YouTube, go back to your podcast platform, wherever you're listening to this too, uh, go back to episode number 40. You can find the full, um, the full interview and find out more about what happens with this client and, uh, what other aspects of digital strategy we address in that, in that, uh, case study. 
So when we come back, we're going to recap some of the things that we, we talked about with Braden and dig a little bit deeper into some of those threads. But before we do that, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. Episode number 48 here. This is the best of 2021 as it relates to digital strategy discussions and interviews. So we're pulling the best interviews uh, of the year from this podcast. We've had 47 glorious episodes so far. These are the best highlights, in our opinion, of things related to digital strategy from the past year. So we just had Braden Gerbig on. We, we played you a clip from back from episode number 40, and he was talking about this uh, chemical manufacturing client of ours in Latin America. And one of the big things he talks about is a standardization across multiple countries and uh, overcoming some of the language and cultural differences and how we had to translate during work sessions and certainly as we get into broader communications and change management activities and training, that translation into the local languages becomes even more important. And this was a really good reminder of the importance of really aligning your digital strategy with your overall goals and objectives. And that's something I talked about in the video clip I played for you earlier in this episode. So in this case, they're trying to standardize their operations. And so you look at what what does their digital strategy need to look like given the fact that they're trying to standardize and really scale, create a common operating model across different countries. That strategy is gonna look a lot different than an organization that say is more entrepreneurial and is trying to keep a certain amount of decentralization and localization let the local business units operate however they need to to be closer to their customers and you know really attack their local markets the way they need to those are two very different strategies and, and you're likely to come up with two very different strategic roadmaps as a result so it's just a good uh, understanding or good reminder that there's certain guard guardrails or parameters that you end up setting as part of your digital strategy or that you should be setting so that you're evaluating and choosing the right technology first of all and that you're deploying it in a way that is consistent with that strategy. So in the case of this chemical manufacturer, they want to standardize across multiple operations. So that, that tells me two things as a consultant. One is that the type of technology they deploy is very important. For example, if they decide that they wanted to use, say, a product like Odoo or Microsoft Dynamics, those are two of the more flexible ERP systems in the marketplace, that's probably not consistent with this model of standardization and scale. It's almost like, even though it's a bad word and a lot of people don't like this word, it's almost like you need a technology that has a certain amount of rigidity and enforces a certain amount of rigidity within the organization. When this company started out, obviously they were probably a lot more entrepreneurial. They probably valued the flexibility and sort of the, the more of the gunslinging type of approach to running the business. But now they've matured to the point where they say, hey, let's throttle back that gunslinging approach and let's shift the needle from total flexibility to a little bit more standardization. So that's gonna lead you more down the path, likely uh, towards like an SAP S4HANA or an Oracle NetSuite or one of the systems or technologies on the marketplace that's meant to drive standard business processes. So that's the one way that your business model, your business strategy can best enable uh, your, your digital strategy or, or the ways your digital strategy can affect or influence the types of technology you deploy or that you, you select. The second way is when it comes to implementation, we think about how do we, what does our roadmap look like when it comes down to this particular strategy, which is to standardize operations. If we want to standardize operations, we have different cultures, different languages, different operating models throughout different countries. That tells me that we need to take more time up front early in the deployment, to just focus on business processes. 
let's focus on standardizing our operations, figuring out what the best answer is for our organization in each of these different functional areas, and let's sort of flush that out and work together as a team to define that so that by the time we bring the system integrator in, we bring in the technology, we have a clear vision and blueprint for what we want the business to be. If we don't do that, what ends up happening is you bring in the technology, you assume the technology is just going to standardize the operations for you, and by the way, it doesn't. Uh, what ends up happening is you end up just configuring the software to do things the way you've always done it. You end up localizing more than you need to. You're probably going to end up customizing more than you want to because you haven't clearly defined what that standard operating model is. The other thing that might happen in addition to that is that you end up spending a lot more time and money on the implementation because you haven't taken the time to define what it is you want to be in when you grow up. So as the system integrators and the software vendors are trying to deploy new technologies, you're spinning your wheels trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, but the meter's running, time's running out. You're spending time and money on these consultants that are billing you whether you're ready or not. They've staffed the project assuming that you're ready to roll, and maybe you are, maybe you're not. But if you haven't figured out what you want to be when you grow up, chances are you're not. So that's the two ways that your overall business strategy should affect your digital strategy and the way your digital strategy and roadmap should enable your, your bigger picture uh, corporate goals and objectives. And that's just one example. When you look at all the decisions that need to be made as part of a digital strategy, there's just a ton of them. You want to make sure all those decisions are aligned. You want to make sure they're deliberate. And you want to make sure all those decisions align with your not only each other, but with the overarching goals and objectives and business model that you're trying to move towards as an organization. So that's that's probably the biggest thing that I, that I could say as it relates to how digital strategy is affected by who you are and what you're trying to be when you grow up. And in this case of this particular client, uh, those are some examples of how, how that goes into, into play. There's also the whole concept or another decision that needs to be made is, are we going to do a rip and replace and put in an entirely new system or are we gonna do more of an upgrade? And for some organizations, there's a clear answer. It's, it's a no-brainer in some cases that, yeah, we're just going to upgrade our existing technology. Maybe the current technology works well. It's been a good fit for you, and now it's just time to do an upgrade. The one thing there is that you don't want to oversimplify what an upgrade means, especially in today's day and age. If you're moving from a legacy on-premise system to a more modern cloud-based systems, chances are that that's a total re-implementation, even if it's the same vendor. If you're going from ECC from SAP to S4 HANA, or if you're going from Microsoft Dynamics to uh, Microsoft D365, if you're going from Oracle EBS to Oracle Fusion Cloud, or Oracle Fusion Org Cloud, then those are just examples of, those are, those are re-implementations. That's not an upgrade. They'll, they'll sell you as an upgrade because, hey, it's the same vendor and it sounds, sounds good, right? That you're buying the same software from the same vendor, so it's gonna be easy, but it's not, especially in today's day and age. It, and by the way, it was never really true even in the on-premise days, you'd have these major new releases that were pretty disruptive to organizations. Now those upgrades and those re-implementations are even more disruptive because now you're, the, the difference between the legacy systems and the cloud systems um, that are coming out today, the, the gap between those is very large, which means the gap between where you are today and what the cloud systems can do is very large. For better and for worse, by the way, in some cases, it's better functionality that the old systems didn't have in other cases, there's actually functionality missing in these new systems because they haven't had the decades of R&D and product development behind them as they have with the, the on-premise system. So just a couple of things to think about. You want to make sure that you understand um, you know, how big of a jump it is realistically for you to go from where you are today to where you're going in the future, and also how you're going to get there. How quickly can you realistically get there? That gets back to your culture, making sure you, you understand your culture, make sure you understand your risk tolerance. If you have a low risk tolerance, you're probably not going to swing for the fences and do this massive big bang changeover quickly. You're probably going to do more of an incremental steady approach. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong answer. You just want to make sure that it's aligned with what it is you're trying to be. So, you know, some of the ways that we help clients do that and understand who they are and what they're trying to be is to help them assess their needs through frontline interviews, um, understanding their strategic goals and objectives, reviewing their current processes and operations, defining their future state processes and operations, ident identifying potential software vendors that, that might be good fits for them, and um, also you know going through the whole demo and software evaluation process. And we have uh, a database of requirements that we use um, that captures 30,000 different business requirements against all the different enterprise technologies in the space. 
So we use that model to sort of help clients figure out what the best path forward is. But even once you've selected the technology, that's just part of the equation. Now you've got to figure out how you're going to deploy that technology. And that's where, you know, your culture, your operating model, uh, your overall goals and objectives, that all should influence how you deploy technology. And, and this is where you have to be careful. And yes, you want to listen to your vendors, you want to hear what they have to say. But at the end of the day, what really matters is what your goals and objectives are and making sure you have a, a strategy and roadmap that aligns with those goals and objectives. The software vendor may be selling you something that's very beneficial to them or they've seen work at other clients. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. So you really have to be objective and clear-eyed about it and understand that this is your business and you decide how you're going to deploy the technology, which modules you're going to use, um, you know, whether or not you're going to customize, what you're going to integrate to, what other third-party systems you might integrate to. That's all up to you. Um, and a lot of organizations forget that and they defer too much to, to their software vendors. So one of the keys to digital strategy is just making sure you have that, that uh, clear understanding and alignment. And then, um, you know, and the last thing I'll say is that you want to make sure you, you understand the industry and the, the legacy system you're using, understand the strengths and the weaknesses of that legacy system and what, you know, what it is you want to retain, and then understand what's not working so well. What are the opportunities for improvement and how could you make that better? So anyway, that, that's a, a little bit of an overview, sort of a debrief of that case study with Braden. And I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to get into this HCM, a digital strategy case study, which is with an oil and gas company. And we're going to interview or play you part of an interview with Allison Hopkins, who's a senior manager at Third Stage Consulting. And she led that project for this particular client in Asia Pacific. Uh, but before we bring Allison on the show, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. Episode number 48 of this podcast is what you're listening to. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and all the audio podcast platforms out there. We're on dozens and if not hundreds of different podcast platforms. Quite frankly, many of them I've never heard of, but we're, we're out there. You can find us there wherever uh, you listen to podcasts. Be sure to look for Transformation Ground Control. Subscribe, leave us a review. We'd love to hear your feedback as well. So, our next guest, the next clip we're going to play is with Allison Hopkins, who's a senior manager at Third Stage Consulting. She recently led one of our clients through their HCM or HR technology digital strategies. It's an oil and gas company, very large oil and gas company based in Asia Pacific. And uh, we're going to play this clip uh, for you where she talks about some of the lessons learned from helping this client define their human capital management uh, digital strategy. So let's play the clip right here. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I guess to start, maybe you could give us a little bit of context of the client, uh, what they do, how many employees they have. Maybe just tell us a little bit about the client uh, that we're working with here. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a really great partner in Southeast Asia. They are a large manufacturer of oil and gas, and they are a subsidiary of a of a larger global company, but um, they've got a, a fantastic pipeline of natural resources and um, they have about 4,000 employees of their own in the country. And they work with an additional 2,000 contractors that come and go and bounce from the larger um, 
uh, parent company back and forth between the, their their country and company. So um, a really interesting dynamic from um, uh, employee uh, population, um, and um, and they they're one of the leaders in their industry. So they've got a lot of skilled resources that they're passing along globally around globally, and it just makes things interesting from an HR perspective. Right. Yeah, it's a oil and gas is always interesting because it's an essential thing that we all need, but also just the the whole process behind actually producing oil and gas is, is fascinating. It's always been fascinating to me. Absolutely. Um, so what I guess if you if you think back to the very beginning of this project, and this is a project that we're right in the middle of, you know, we're kind of in the thick of it as we speak. But when you think back to the beginning of when we started our partnership with this client, what why did they hire us? I mean, what was, what were they, what was the problem statement or what, what, how had they defined the transformation that they wanted us to help with? Yeah. So, um, when we started this engagement, uh, we had a core team of HR leaders within their HR, um, information systems group that, that really was established as our project team. They had an outgoing executive, um, that had been with the company for a number of years. Um, this individual had implemented SAP and, um, they had really great successes with SAP for the last call it eight years, but with all of the digital digitalization that has happened um, and with the new opportunity to have a new leader in this area, um, they really hired Third Stage to help them get set up with um, solid processes, an inventory of where they were currently, an inventory of where they wanted to go in the future. And then they're looking to us to help them match them up with the best solution provider um, for an HCM system. And they had, um, you know, some competing priorities, um, but um, in terms of an ERP or should they do ERP first or should they do HCM? And so that's been um, conversations that we've had with their uh, HR team, HR leaders throughout the entire process. Hmm. Okay. So was there a um, was there a tipping point or a some sort of challenge that they ran into as an organization that, that led them or triggered them to, to reach out to us? Or was it something that built over time? Or how did they how did they get to that point where they said, hey, we need to really look at our ERP and HCM systems and reevaluate where we're at? Right. Well, um, their parent company um, had selected uh, Workday and um, are actually imp implementing Workday to help them um, as a global company. And there are facets of their their process on um, their HR process that they would like this company to use. But this company really recognizes that their region is different. Uh, the some of the government um, uh, standards and the benefits that they provide to their employee population are not necessary in other parts of the world. So they have um, different requirements and their employees expect different interactions with them than um, say a European or a US based company would. And so um, that's been a lot of, of the reason why they've looked to experts to say, what software providers have these things available? And what are the ways that we can um, upgrade the experience for our employees um, throughout their lives? Because it's not just um, when they go to work specifically for, for this region. Um, they provide some housing, they provide different um, support from uh, a financial standpoint to their their employees. They're involved in, in some of the debt that they carry and they're responsible for that as an employer. And so they have very um, specific requirements that not every solution is going to meet. And so um, they've asked us to help them with that. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a, very interesting. It's a, it's a good reminder of, you know, if we step back and look at what is digital transformation or what is business transformation, you know, it's a lot more than just looking at back office business processes. It's also about, you know, employee experience and customer experience and different stakeholders exactly. that are affected. Exactly. And, you know, because they are a subsidiary, they need to have very tight, strong integrations to the over, overall experience that this global company um, 
is all about, but they do have to do it in a slightly different way. And so, you know, the, the, the systems that the parent company are using, they're not off the, they're not off the table as a provider for them in the future. They just want to ensure that it's the right provider for them. And they're, that, that, um, that they're going to have a good relationship and relationship is very important to them. It's less about a transaction or this, this, some um, system, you know, being something that they use, um, on their computers or their handheld devices, this is actually, um, you know, a very um, important piece that the relationship is going to be right with this, this new partner. Right. Now, what about the, uh, the dynamics between the, the parent company and the, you know, at the local level here, you know, are there political dynamics at play or operational dynamics, or what are some of the challenges that, um, that comes specifically from the fact that it's a, I don't want to say it's a complex organization necessarily, although it is, uh, but it's more the fact that you've got the parent company and the, the local company. Are there challenges or unique factors at play there in that dynamic? There is. Um, the, the Really, um, the requirements that the parent company have put on to the subsidiary, our client, are that they have to train their employees. There are certain trainings that are going to be consistent to maintain that brand of the, the parent company. And, um, and so the, the talent management portion um, is one that, um, that, they're less concerned about um, the new solution having it because they, they might wholesale take the parent company's training and um, amend it slightly. So um, that's one interesting factor. Um, and then really just the data. I think um, the data that's shared back and forth um, and the privacy, um, the government definitely has um, some um, restrictions that are different. Um, every country has unique data privacy standards, and this one is no different. And so uh, because the parent company is from a different um, country, there are some more requirements that we are considering uh, for for the selection of a, a future partner. So what are some of the challenges that we're seeing so far with this client in terms of the, the project and any roadblocks or obstacles or pain points we're seeing as we help this client get started on their journey? Yeah. So um, I think the biggest uh, challenge was, you know, working with different cultures. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, um, we all react differently and we have social norms. And really with this client, they expect to be very buttoned up and polished and prepared um, to go into any workshop type setting. So in in, um, in consulting uh, in engagement, you know, do a lot of workshops, you do a lot of whiteboarding and solutioning um, in a group setting. And this client really likes to have a pre-read, react to it, come and present back rather than doing um, a lot of, you know, thought uh, thought sessions. So that has been a challenge. And that was something in the beginning that we had to figure out um, just culturally how they like to conduct their meetings, how prepared they needed to be um, to walk into conversations. So um, this is um, this this cultural norm really shows through in the way that they have documentation and the way that they store and share information within their organization. So um, they're very buttoned up from a process perspective, which was really helpful. Um, but um, one of the things that we uncovered was that there is a very heavy reliance on existing functionality embedded in their process rather than um, and in their documentation, rather than saying, uh, you know, I um, we hire employees and these are the activities that we go through to hire the employees or to prepare for a new employee for onboarding, um, rather than talking through those activities, they really were they really would talk us through what steps they took within their system. And so um, we had many education sessions um, where we broke down um what is a process and what is a procedure and what are the action steps that then are taken within the systems or within the, the um, communications within their organization. And so um, we're bringing some of our change management elements 
into the early conversations so that they can um, understand, you know, different ways that their employees may want to consume information rather than being so buttoned up. Um, they might be losing some context of uh, and great ideas um, through the, the very formal process. So I'd say that's a challenge that we worked through and that, um, that, uh, that we've been able to help them with. Um, um, and, and it's just something that, um, that was new to me, um, working with a, a, a client from this region. And I think um, they, they really see us as trusted partners now that we recognize the need we, for being able to share information and present it in, in a different way. And so um, it, that, that's been a really great experience to, to see that the evolution of that. Right. Right. All right. Thanks, Allison. That's good stuff. Thanks for being on the show again. And that that's a good clip. And if you like what you heard there, uh, that discussion, you can find way back in episode number three, which uh, came out in, I think, February of this year of 2021. So be sure to check that out if you if you want to hear more about it, particularly if you want to hear what happened after everything she talks about in that that interview. So when we come back, we're going to take a we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'll, I'll debrief some of the key points that really struck struck a chord with me. And we're also going to bring on uh, Khalid Morris from Third Stage Consulting. He's going to talk about the whole sports um, industry, the whole concept of athletics and sports and winning and how that applies to digital transformation. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. This is episode number 48, the best of 2021 in digital strategy discussions. And we just had Allison Hopkins on the show talking about uh, setting an HCM strategy for an oil and gas company. And really interesting stuff because, you know, some of the things that she talked about, which is a bit different than the first case study with Braden that we had earlier in the episode, is that, you know, a lot of what she talked about is having different requirements for their global footprint. So you have different cultures, different environments where they really focused on localizing some of that employee experience on the HCM side of things. So again, it's a good reminder that either strategy can work, whether you want to standardize and have one you know, more, more uh, structured, um, I hate to say inflexible in a bad way, because that's not bad necessarily, uh, but sort of standardized, less flexible model versus highly localized, highly uh, decentralized. And again, it comes back to is if that's your business model, stick with it. And if that's what your business model is going to be going forward, stick with it. It, it doesn't matter what the software vendors think you should do. It doesn't matter what the technology limitations are necessarily. It matters more what it is you're trying to accomplish as an organization. So that was pretty interesting. That was a pretty interesting contrast from the first case study we had. Um, they had very specific requirements um, that were used to help define the software that best met their needs. So we really spent a lot of time with them getting into a lot of detail of what their business requirements were. And in a lot of ways, some organizations would look at that effort and say, hey, that's stuff you would do downstream when you selected the software and as you start implementing it. But in this case, they had such unique requirements that it was really important for us to define all that stuff up front so that we got it right as it related to the technology and that we weren't trying to force a, a square peg into a round hole, so to speak. There's also the, the dynamics that we had to navigate with the, the parent company versus the local uh, company as it related to uh, data sharing. So governments all have unique data privacy regulations. And so it's a, another reminder that part of your digital strategy is not just what you want to do and what you want to be when you grow up, but also what do you have to be from a regulatory perspective and how can you make sure that the technology you deploy supports those regulatory needs. 
and that can be a big deal breaker or showstopper if you don't do that. So that those dynamics between the parent company and local, uh, you know, data sharing is, is very important and making sure you've got you're navigating those nuances at the local level. And then the other interesting thing that really stood out for me was that the um, the biggest challenge of the project was working with different cultures. Um, you know, in this case, they didn't like the working sessions. Um, you know, how we had to look at how prepared they wanted to be, how they store and share information. We sort of had, had to adapt in a different way than we had had to with other clients over the years. And so, again, another reminder that you have to look at the culture of the different parts of your organization. Working sessions in a certain style of designing technology or selecting technology might work for one way for certain parts of your organization, but it might look different for other parts of your organization. So you want to make sure you, you navigate that and uh, address all those different nuances uh, culturally. So those are some of the really interesting findings that I had or the, the interesting takeaways that I had from the discussion. And I thought that was really interesting um, stuff. So I'm going to shift gears here and I want to uh, jump into this conversation, uh, another clip from episode number 38. And this one features Khalid Morris from Third Stage Consulting. And in this clip, he talks about sports and the science of winning and how that relates to digital transformation. And, I, and I'm a big fan of analogies and I particularly like sports analogies. I like lessons from sports because it's so raw and pure. It's so focused on performance and winning. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in business in general, but certainly with digital transformations to where we can be a little bit more structured and disciplined and uh, you know, focused on conditioning and game planning and execution and all the stuff that athletes focus on and teams focus on when they're winning teams. That sort of lesson and mentality is something that I think uh, has a, an important role in digital transformations and digital strategies in general. So I'm going to play this clip. It's about 14 minutes. This is going back to episode number 38. And again, this is Khalid Morris, who is a director of strategy and transformation at Third Stage Consulting. Um, he, by the way, uh, was a college athlete. He, he competed at the collegiate level in basketball. Uh, you can't see in the video, but he's extremely tall. He looks like a basketball player, and he is a basketball player. Um, and he also uh, coaches. He, he actually coaches um, kids that are my younger son's age, and we actually occasionally uh, play in the same leagues and play against each other, although I will say his team is much better than my son's team. In fact, I think we, we play them this weekend. Um, I should probably confirm that before this podcast, but I'm almost positive that we are unfortunate enough to have to play his team, which is very good. They, they won a, a big tournament championship uh, at a recent tournament we went to over the summer. But anyway, that's, that's off track a little bit, uh, but the, we'll bring Khalid on the show here. We'll play this quick clip here, uh, about 14 minutes about sports and the science of winning as it relates to digital transformation. Let's roll the clip. You know, these little, little things that you talk about, these, these little details that you work on, the fundamental mm -hmm. skills, the, you know, in basketball, you know, dribbling, shooting, defending, all that, all that stuff. And there's obviously within just those buckets, there's obviously tons of little details. But with transformations, a lot of times, you have a couple of problems. One is a lot of times organizations don't know what the important details are, or they, they get caught up in the wrong details, right. um, or they just, um, they're just spread so thin that they, they miss out on those details. And I think that's a really important point to bring up because I think that's where a lot of companies fail in their implementations or their transformations is in the little things. It's not the big strategic things. Oftentimes it's the, the little since, things. So what, what are your thoughts? Since, since, since we're going with these analogies, I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to know that even great players need coaches, you know, like, you know, some of the, I think one of the biggest, I heard Isaiah Thomas talk about this with respect to Isaiah, to uh, LeBron James, but he had mentioned that if you look at the great players, they all had great coaching. So if you look at Jordan, uh, historically, you know, the magic, they all had these, these, these coaches that you can kind of point these hall of fame type of coaches. And, and LeBron was sort of, he was making the analogy say, that's how great he is. He doesn't even have that. <laughs> like he doesn't have this amazing, you know, Bobby Knight or, you know, Pat Riley to sort of say, you know, this is the guy, Phil Jackson, this is the guy, or Dean Smith. These are the guys that coached me into learning the game a certain way, right? LeBron didn't really have those pillars, but he's still, you know, a, a Mount Rushmore kind of kind of basketball player. And it's amazing. So I, I say that to say great players, even great players need coaches, right? Keeping LeBron aside, even great players need coaches. And 
I think that with organizations, uh, a lot of the times, and I've been on sites where, you know, consulting has sort of, you know, not been, and we'll, I won't talk about the client, but has, hasn't been welcome. Right? They're kind of like, well, you know, we, we got it. We know what we're doing. You know, we, we kind of don't necessarily need a consultant to kind of come in or a consulting company to kind of come in. My boss may think that that's necessary, but I don't. And I, I think that it's when you get that independent view, that, that third party view, it, that guidance, I think you only get enhanced, right? And even if you're great, because you already know what you do well. And they're coming in and sharing you gaps, sharing gaps with you, identifying these areas. So these are areas that you can get bad to take your organization to an even uh, uh, to an even higher level. I think it's important for organizations to take heed to that guidance, kind of put it into their own kit. Like I already got a big kit of things I do great. I'm gonna put that in it, and I'm gonna do even better, and just sort of maximize uh, the growth, maximize the the. Um, you know where an organization can kind of go so to that i would say yeah even organizations need coaches everyone needs guidance just like everyone needs a mom and dad like everyone kind of needs someone to kind of say look man i why don't you look in this left direction why don't you look you know my 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 son he loves to go left i always kind of tell him why don't you look at the right side there's nothing wrong you're great at going left you'll always be great at going right the uh, left why don't you Go left and look right. And if nothing is over there, go over there too, because there's a big court out here and you can go both ways. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. Good advice. So, so I guess, you know, what it sounds like you're saying is that organizations and their leaders and project team members that are part of these, these transformations, they need to be open to coaching and they need to recognize that even if they're really good and they've been through this time a few times before, they still can benefit from having someone coach. It'd be like, I guess, to to not want to do that would be a lot like the player on a team who says, "No, I'm actually really good, so I don't need a coach. So I, I've got this coach. You just right. go coach someone else. If, and I'm, I'm good." If, if the goal is, and transformation goal is equivalent to a championship, right? So if your goal is to win a championship, you have to be open to that guidance, right? If if for nothing, if for no other reason. It's because you want all parts of your organization to pull in the right in the same direction. Uh, so part of that is making sure everyone is aligned. That that is there's a certain level of sacrifice that's required with that. So even if you're a great basketball player, you know you you might be able to do everything on the basketball court. You may know I I do everything on the basketball court, but this person is going to have to do this part. I'm going to have to take care of that part. And this other person is going to have to take care of that. And we're going to have to talk to each other to make sure that everyone knows what everyone is doing so that we're all pulling in the right direction. That is a, that is a, uh, a, that is, that is sort of path, like a framework, a template for how do you win a championship? Well, you know, everyone understands your role and you sort of play together. It's the same way with organizations. And if you're trying to, have that digital transformation on the other end. You need to identify the things that you need to do as a part of what you need to 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 lock down in order to accomplish that, as well as every other person or every other part of the department or, or whatnot. So we're locking hands and we're doing this together. It's not a a singular mission. And so and so yeah, you might be great at something, but you know, let's look at this from an organizational perspective. Let's look at it. Let's let's look at what we're trying to accomplish. And then let's talk about what you're great at. And then let's also talk about what you need to do. Maybe you're not great at it or maybe you just haven't been doing that because that just hasn't been part of your job description. Well, now, in order for us to get to where we need to be, it now has to be a part of your job description. Right. So so sharing those roles, defining those roles, because in organizations, we're not as communicative as maybe we are on the court on the basketball court i'm always telling young younger players you got to talk if you listen to pros pros are vocal if you are sitting courtside um, at a basketball game and an nba game or a professional game you're just going to hear talking 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 and most of it you know you may think oh they're talking trash most of it is not most of it is i'm talking to my teammate i'm letting him know i'm on my left i'm on his left side i'm letting him know i'm in health I let them letting them know that, you know, don't worry about force the guy my way or, you know, I'm going to push him your way or you get the rebound. I'm on the wing. Just throw it. You know, you, you constantly have to talk to your teammates so that they know where you are. And that's that's what keeps teams in sync. 
And that's what lets everybody know things. So you can talk to your coaches saying, this is what I'm seeing. Your coach is saying, this is what I'm seeing. I mean, it's a consistent talkative effort. And in business, oddly enough, there's not a lot of talking all the time. You know, sometimes we have collaboration issues uh, amongst each other. Sometimes we, we relegate everything to an email versus to, to, to be able to kind of open up and kind of, you know, voice or kind of talk, you know, about it right next to each other, right? Used to, there's a couple of studies I saw about, you know, uh, organizations that are sitting in queues and they're emailing each other right next. It's like, how come you can't just tell them, <laughs> just lean over and just, just say, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, but it's important to kind of have those communication points. And I just feel like that's missing a lot in, um, in a lot of these dynamics. And, and, and when you define those roles and you have those communication, everybody knows what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, this is what you're doing. And then having adjustments along that way, I know you're doing this, I'm also gonna need you to do this. And everybody's working towards that goal and you get there. If, if you're in isolation and you're just doing, well, this is what I do and I'm really good at it, then you don't get there. And it just sort of leaves gaps in your organization. Yeah. All right, good stuff. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back from this quick break, we're going to pick things up with Khalid talking about sports and the science of winning and digital transformation. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. We're in the middle of an interview discussion with Khalid Morris talking about sports and the analogies with digital transformation. Let's get right back into the clip. Yeah, you had a couple things or a couple threads. You had sort of the the first part of your response is focused on sort of that strategic alignment and planning. And then you were getting into more what I would call the execution when you're out on the court. You know, how do you pivot? How do you adjust, communicate mm -hmm. you sort of in real time? And so you've got two layers there. And so maybe if we start with that first layer of, of call it strategy and planning for a transformation, mm -hmm. that's much like a sports team that wants to win a championship. And to win the championship, they need to beat, you know, whoever the other contender is and that contender has strengths and weaknesses. You've got strengths and weaknesses and you come up with a game plan of how are we going to beat these guys or, or gals. And so um, it kind of gets to that whole concept of putting together a strategy, a playbook. You know, how does that whole concept of planning and, in, in, you know, the playbook concept relate to? You know, you know, what's what's funny is when you think about a digital transformation, uh, it's kind of outside the organization. Like you, you have a mission, your organization has a mission, they have goals, they've been functioning for a long period of time up to this point. And then somebody or, or some group of people, usually a consultant or somebody comes in and says, you guys need, let's talk about your transformation. <laughs> let's talk about your transformation journey. And it's just like, you, we've been successful up until this point. I know you have, I know you have, but you know, it's kind of like you have a new appoint, opponent. Your 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 competition is different right now. You know, your your competition is doing things that you aren't doing in the marketplace, and that's what you're going up against. In effect, a new game, and because you have a new game, we're going to have a new playbook. We're going to have a transformation journey that we're going to throw in the middle of this. I know you've been successful, but now we have to get prepared for for this opponent and um, and and what you're going to have to do tomorrow to be successful. And, and that's that's a hard concept for a lot of organizations to really wrap their mind around. Like uh, the idea of, you know, it's it's not a knock. It's not a negative to say that, you know, we're, we're doing something that we've never done before. Like that is a normal part of, that's a part of survival. Uh, certainly in the business world, you always have to change. Success, successful businesses are always changing. They're always learning. I love um, organizations that embrace that and understand that 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 we're always going to change and uh, we're, we're, we're going to be ready for tomorrow and and being ready for tomorrow is exactly what you're saying it's that 
digital transformation, for example, and saying, okay, all right, here's a, here's a new transformation playbook. We're going to have some new roles, new responsibilities just for this game. And we're going to have to do things a little bit differently. And in order to do that, we're going to do some practice stages and, and reps so that everyone understands what their new role is going to be. This is the defense we're going to play. And we have to zone uh, as group, right? Maybe they're not good shooters. And so we're going to throw in zones here, or maybe we're going to press them or, or, or whatever the case may be. But it's all a part of this new playbook. And I know we didn't do that in the last few games, but we're going to have to do it this next week. And so that articulation and then that concentration of all hands getting put in, again, all hands on deck with that particular goal in mind is uh, kind of what makes successful teams successful. They're always ready for the challenge, despite the fact that it could be a great challenge. And I, I think organizations should embrace that, that mentality and almost um, patriot like the Patriots are, you know, you talk about a, a, a playbook, you know, in football, I love football playbooks because they're huge, like a thousand pages. It's kind of like, you know, this, this huge book that you kind of have to read, right? And, and they give you this in the off season and they say, okay, here's this huge book that you have to read, let you know everything you need to know about us and all the plays we're going to run this season. Well, um, often from what I, I gather from the Patriots, they do that like every week. So it's like just a new playbook every single week. Like it's whatever we were talking about last week, we're doing nothing like that now. <laughs> we're not running the ball this, this week. We are going to throw a gazillion times and we're going to throw here a gazillion times. And then they rep that. And, and, and that's part of why they've been able to be so successful because they've, they've been able to get all, I guess, 53 guys, the entire organization aligned to an, a, 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 new way of playing or sort of a new way of thinking every single week so you never really know what they're going to do it's it's kind of this brand new attack it's it's a brand new. i've never seen you guys do this before well you we never needed to but we're going to do it this week <laughs> you know it's kind of their attitude and and, and I, I love that model and i think more again more organizations should adopt that um, as it relates to digital transformation right you just go through it and you're going to have to go through it again so just go through it be the new you you live in that space so long as that's competitive and then you adjust again as you kind of need to as the world changes around you and you know if nothing else we should know now from a COVID perspective you can't prepare for what tomorrow looks like right you just sort of you just sort of model it you just sort of say okay all right this is what we're going to do tomorrow tomorrow comes tomorrow could be very different <laughs> you know, tomorrow comes you're like okay be prepared to do it this way. Now we're going to have to adjust again to do it that way. So being able to adjust is, I think, paramount to, to being a successful organization. And when you start talking transformation journey, to be able to cut that down and say, let's have shorter transformation journeys. Let's let us let us be able to do this quickly. Let's not take five years to transform. Let's 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 be able to make these transformations in shorter intervals. I think you you allow your organization the, the kind of adaptability and flexibility to be prepared for whatever happens in the future. All right. Thanks, Khalid. Thanks for that great insight. Uh, when we come back from a quick break, we're going to uh, debrief some of the things you talked about there and and uh, highlight some of the key points from the message there or from your your points there. And uh, again, if you like that interview, you want to hear more of it, it's a really good discussion, especially if you like what you heard in that segment. I think you would like the whole interview. Be sure to go back to episode number 38 of this podcast to hear the rest of that interview or the full interview, which is close to an hour long, if I remember correctly. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, Turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 48. 
This is the best of 2021, the digital strategy version or, or uh, segment in the series. And we just had this discussion with Khalid talking about sports and, and uh, the analogy with digital transformation. And there were some really good takeaways in here that I think are, are worth noting here. Uh, one is that failure comes from the fundamentals. Um, even great players need coaches just like clients need good consultants. And so we really do view ourselves as, as coaches in these cases, really uh, someone or a group of people like us who study the game. We study digital transformation. We do it every day. And being able to take some of those lessons and some of the mistakes that we've made, that we've seen our clients make, and being able to help you avoid those same mistakes is something that's very important um, as it relates to digital transformation and that analogy with sports. Um, organizations and leaders need to be open to strategic coaching because of all, all parts of the business need to be going in the same direction. And a lot of times having that outside perspective of people that look at all these different organizations throughout the world, looking at your organization and being able to see with that fresh set of eyes how you're different or where you're misaligned or where the risks and pitfalls are or all of the above, all that's really important um, in terms of this analogy with coaching and sports and digital transformation success. The other is team communication is such a key to success. I, I know with a, a younger son or two younger sons that are learning sports, especially basketball and football, American football, um, the coaches are constantly harping on them that they need to communicate more. They need to shout out and talk to each other and, and make pivots on the fly and adjust. And when they're not communicating, that's when they're losing. And it's, again, it sounds pretty basic, but it's a good reminder when you think about digital transformation or transformation in business in general, if you're not communicating, you're probably not winning. You're probably failing and you're probably struggling. So making sure that you've got that communication is, is very important. And I know Khalid mentioned in the clip that NBA players never stop talking to each other and that's how they win. The most elite athletes communicate really well. Uh, or if you look at, uh, like Tom Brady, um, from the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he's won a bunch of Super Bowls in American football. He's constantly communicating and talking to his team, giving feedback, good and bad. I mean, he's, he's a guy that likes to yell at his players when, when they mess up or they run the wrong route. And he lets it be known when there was a mistake made or if he has to call an audible at the line, he's very clear about what that audible is and he's very good at it. So you kind of look at people like that, athletes like that, and think, how can I apply some of those lessons and some of those skill sets to, to my digital transformation? And then you also have team strengths and weaknesses regarding strategic goals. Um, so those are some of the, the things to be thinking about as well. Um, and then understanding the competition's playbook and using that and defining your digital strategy and just having a clear playbook, that's really important. If you're going in cold without a clear plan, a clear business blueprint, clear business processes, clear change strategy, if you haven't defined that stuff within your digital strategy and roadmap, it's like walking into a game with no game plan. And chances are you're about to get demolished by the competition. In the case of digital transformation, you're going to get demolished by resistance to change, misalignment, technological issues, all the stuff that can go wrong. And a digital transformation probably will go wrong if you don't have a clear digital strategy. So th those are just some of the lessons. And, and the last thing I'll say is just being able to adjust, embrace new technologies. Being flexible is extremely important. So that's something you want to want to watch for and really hone in on as well. So I, I hope that interview has sort of given you some things to think about as you think about how do we create this playbook, this overall strategy, game plan for our digital strategy. And I hope the other interviews too have given you some context and examples of how digital strategies can vary and what some of the different nuances are, different considerations. Some of them may be relevant to you, some of them maybe not, but even if they're not all relevant to you, some of these lessons, it's an, hopefully a way to get you to think about how can I create a digital strategy and roadmap that's specific to my organization that fits my needs and helps me accomplish my business goals and objectives. So that is what we had for you, the best of 2021. Uh, this is the fourth and final in our series of the best of 2021. We cover people, process, technology in episodes number 45, 46, 47. This episode obviously covered digital strategy, which sort of rounds out the entire spectrum at a high level of what you need for digital transformation success. And again, if you haven't gone back and listened to previous episodes earlier in the year, I encourage you to go back and scroll through, look at not just the interviews we've highlighted here today, but look back at some of the other episodes. You might find some topics that are relevant to you or of interest to you, so be sure to check that out. And again, we'll have new episodes uh, picking up again in the new year. Starting uh, first week of January, we'll have our first episode of 2022 uh, on that Wednesday, the first Wednesday of January. And uh, we'll have new episodes every Wednesday from then on throughout the year, and you can find those new episodes on YouTube, on LinkedIn, as well as all the audio podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel in the meantime, as well as Third Stage's YouTube channel. 
And uh, be sure to su subscribe to us or follow us on social media, whether it's YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you are, look for us. We're always putting stuff out there, whether it be new videos, new podcasts like these, blogs, white papers, all that good stuff. So I hope you found this all helpful. I appreciate you all listening in here today. We'll have Kyler back next week, so you won't have to listen to me the entire time. And I uh, hope you all have a happy new year, happy holidays, and look forward to seeing you in the new year in 2022. We'll see you next time on Transformation Ground Control.